Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder, and last time I covered Patrick Claiborne's attack on the Union left flank. Now I'll be covering Benjamin Cheatham's Corps' attack against the federal position. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, join the Patreon page, or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. While William Hardy's Corps attacked the Union left flank, Confederate Army of Tennessee commander John Bell Hood was preparing another corps to throw themselves against the Union line held by the Union Army of the Tennessee, now commanded by John A. Logan. Hardy's attacks were stalling out as another Confederate corps approached the field of battle. Although Hardy's corps hadn't been as successful as hoped for, their major attack drew Union troops from the Army of the Tennessee's right to its left, leaving an 800-yard gap in the Union line, north of the railroad. The next Confederate corps to enter the fight was commanded by Benjamin Cheatham. Cheatham was a Tennessean and had been given temporary command of Hood's old corps when that general took command of the whole army. Cheatham controlled the corps until the permanent commander of the unit, Stephen D. Lee, made it to the outskirts of Atlanta from Mississippi. It was 3.15 p.m. when Hood ordered Cheatham's men forward. John C. Brown commanded Thomas Heinemann's old division after Heinemann left the Army of Tennessee. Brown's division straddled the railroad while Carter Stevenson's division occupied the right and Henry Clayton held the left flank. The three divisions moved out from their position in the defenses around Atlanta. However, for unknown reasons, Stevenson's division only went part of the way to the Federal line and didn't move further, leaving Clayton and Brown's divisions to launch their attacks without the full corps' strength. Clayton, during the advance, moved behind Brown's division. Arthur Manigault commanded a brigade in Brown's division, and he remembered the Union as he advanced. There stood the enemy in their breastworks. Their flags were fluttering lazily in the breeze. I saw and noticed all this only for a moment, and thought it looked very pretty, but in the next instant the whole scene was shut out, everything enveloped in smoke. The two Confederate divisions closed in on the Union position, but as they advanced, a huge gap emerged in Brown's line, so he decided to plug it with Samuel Benton's brigade. The small brigade could do little against the enemy in their front. During the fight, Benton would be hit in the chest by an artillery shell fragment and be hit in the foot by a Union bullet. Doctors would amputate the foot, but Benton would die six days later from his wounds. In his absence, William Brantley took command of the brigade. The Union rifleman behind earthworks sent the Confederates running after about ten minutes of fighting. By this point, John Coltart and Arthur Manigault were heavily engaged, but couldn't make any headway against the Federals. The 12th Indiana, facing the Confederates south of the railroad, had some Alabama Unionists fighting alongside them. Those Alabamians had joined its ranks when that unit was stationed in northern Alabama. The commander of the regiment allowed one of those Unionists to bring his slave along on the campaign. The slave stood beside the Alabamian and handed him cartridges to make the firing quicker. Brown called on Jacob Sharp's brigade of Mississippians to attack through Manigault's brigade and hit the Union line. The right flank of Sharp's brigade hit the Federals at the railroad cut, which bisected the Union line. The Mississippians began to swarm over the enemy's left flank, taking prisoners and causing havoc in the rear of the line. Within minutes, the entire Federal line broke and ran, although some did hold out until completely surrounded. A member of the 7th Mississippi wrote to his father that, The Yanks were very obstinate in leaving their work. They remained in their ditches until we were in six feet of them. Some surrendered, some run, and some fought till they were killed. I was among them shooting. I have often heard of a hand-to-hand -hand fight, but this time I witnessed it. It was the closest quarters I ever was in. Behind Brown's division was Clayton's division, which had taken up a position behind Brown once the advance began. A hole had been punched in the Union line, and Clayton sent Marcella Stovall's brigade, now commanded by Abda Johnson, into the gap between Sharp and Coltart's men. The added pressure of the Confederate reinforcements and the hole already in the Union line led the Union regiments to Johnson's right to begin to collapse. Soon, Brown's division and part of Clayton's division occupied nearly a mile of enemy works. Each Union brigade that was pushed back attempted to launch their own counterattack, but they were pushed back each time from the musketry of the rebels. Bushrod Jones' brigade of Clayton's division was sent north to help secure the Confederate left. Jones himself went to each of his regimental commanders and told them that they were going to be taking up a position on Manigault's left, but to wait until all the regimental commanders were notified and he gave the order to move. Jones told the first two regiments the plan, then, as he was telling it to the others, 
he saw the 36th and 38th Alabama moving to the left. Manigault, afraid that he would be attacked and scared his left flank was in the air, ordered those two regiments into position. Jones told the rest of his regiments their orders, then moved with them to the northeast. Meanwhile, John Higley, temporarily commanding Alpheus Baker's brigade, moved to the north as well to find the Confederate left flank and extend it or protect it from Union attacks, but the undulating terrain prevented them from finding at their desired location. Randall Gibson's brigade of Louisianians from Clayton's division wouldn't be engaged, never being sent into the fight. Out of the twelve brigades that Cheatham sent into battle, less than half of them were either engaged or took up a position on the Union's abandoned works. As the rebels enjoyed their initial success, the dispossessed Union brigades and reinforcements prepared for a counterattack to take back their position. 